think of the best duos in history, many partnerships might come to mind. Bonnie and Clyde, Holmes and Watson, Batman and Robin, Judy and Nick if you're like a furry or something. But by far and away, the ultimate team, perhaps in the history of our respective species, is that of the human and the dog, the ape and the canid, the person and the pup. This is the story of two predators inadvertently learning to work together in the face of both environmental and ecologic adversity. It's a sort of social symbiosis that would rock both the ancient world and our very genetics. And it is a story that begins long ago, in a world much harsher than the one we inhabit today. From the bitterly cold forests of ancient Europe to the windswept Mongolian steeps of our ancestors, the archaic Homo sapiens trundled across the land in pursuit of the game animals of yesterday. And they were not alone. Another ancient predator had a similar goal in mind. The ancient wolves. It has long been thought that dogs are descended from modern-day gray wolves, but recent studies have shown that this simply isn't the case, even though as of the publishing of this video, Wikipedia maintains that it is so. But a recent study done in 2017 which analyzed the genetic profiles of various wolf species and the domestic dog seems to suggest otherwise. It proposes that modern wolves and modern dogs both descend from an extinct species of ancient wolf. And it was this mystery wolf, known only from its ghostly traces in the canid molecular clock, that competed with our ancestors long ago. How long ago, you might ask? Well, estimates have been pushed back thanks to the results of a brand new study which analyzed the mutation rates of modern dogs, suggesting that the domestication process of the wolves could have begun as long ago as 40,000 years. Now, as far as fossils go, the oldest true dog we have sits around 14,000 years ago, while hybrid wolf dogs can be found as far back as 36,000 years. That's a long time to be bumming around with the dogs. But back to the tale. Of domestication. There's currently a bit of dispute on the where of domestication, with some suggesting that it occurred just in Europe once, while others are proposing that there were two domestication events, one in Europe and one in Asia. But the why and how are more interesting anyways. So the ancient wolves had something of a pest problem. You see, for hundreds of thousands of years, they had competed in the already bloated predator market of ancient Eurasia against saber-toothed cats and hyenas and so on and so forth. But 130,000 years ago, a new predator came on the scene. And like all pests, this strange new creature began to intrude where perhaps it shouldn't have. They were strange apes from the south, not unlike the Neanderthals that kept to themselves up north. But these ones were thinner, and they had long-range weapons in addition to their short-range ones. They lacked claws and had small canines, but these skinny beasts swept in fast, wearing the skins of their kills as they poached on ancient wolf land. And the wolves were likely... perturbed. These naked creatures were copycats, hunting in coordinated groups and barking at one another to communicate. They were, it seemed, out to steal the niche of the wolf. And so, for 90,000 years, the ancient humans, fresh out of Africa, competed with the entire Eurasian bestiary, including the wolves. But around 40,000 years ago, something strange happened. Something very strange indeed. For it was not the humans that domesticated the wolves, as we've long thought but it was actually the wolves that domesticated themselves. Those wretched bipeds had a system. They lived in small settlements which operated like home bases until it was time to move along, and it was on the edges of these open-air dens that the humans butchered the kills they brought back. This left enormous refuse piles of bones and unused viscera, which caught the attention of the ancient wolves along with many other ferocious beasts. But the wolves were unique, for unlike more other solitary or stoic animals, they operated on a hyper-socialized system. These systems can nurture curiosity, as there is power and confidence in a group. And so the wolves began to investigate. 
the brave would approach, eager to score a free meal, and when confronted by a territorial human, they had two options, attack and be killed for aggression, or back down. Of those who did back down and did not flee, some received the pity of the strange bipeds. These are thought to have been the lower ranked wolves who would have had less opportunity to feed than their betters of the pack. And this occasional human empathy led to some wolves sticking around for a free scrap, rather than vie against their stronger brothers and sisters back at the pack. This is the stage of human tolerance for the presence of the wolves around the camp. But odd things happen when social animals of different species convene. The wolves may have become territorial of the human refuse, inadvertently protecting the settlements from the more ferocious predators like the big cats or the hyenas, and offering barked warnings when danger approached the base. And human tolerance likely bloomed into appreciation. Here we begin to see the socialization of both species, where ape and canid alike are beginning to encourage the partnership overall. And of the wolves that stuck around, the friendliest were bred or encouraged to breed by the humans, and something new and exciting began to take place. Dogs and wolves are different physiologically. In 2018, a study identified 429 genes that differed between modern dogs and modern wolves. As the differences in these genes could also be found in ancient dog fossils, they were regarded as being the result of the initial domestication event, and not from recent breed formation. The genes are linked to neural crest and central nervous system development. These genes affect embryogenesis and confer tameness, smaller jaws, floppy ears, and diminished craniofacial development, which distinguish domesticated dogs from wolves and are considered to reflect domestication syndrome. Basically, a handful of genes are responsible for making your dog look like a dog and not like a wolf. The study concluded that during early dog domestication, the initial selection was for behavior. This trait, friendliness, is influenced by neural crest genes, so by selecting for sociable dogs with favorable dispositions to humans, you end up inadvertently influencing genes in the neural crest, giving dogs those floppy ears, curly tails, and a desire to lick and not eat your face. This is a trend that is likely found in all canids, as the same was observed in the Russian fox domestication experiment. As friendly foxes were bred, they began to look more like domestic dogs. As such, a means to track the domestication process is by the skeletons left behind of the wolves, the dogs, and the wolf-dog hybrids. But since the trend was always urged towards friendly canids that were capable of cooperation, we began to see this acceptance transform into a partnership. And it was this partnership that would allow humans to outcompete all other hominids around at this time period, with our pups at our sides. As domestication continued, the humans gained a companion that served as an alarm system for predators, as well as a herder and a tracker for hunting purposes. The canids got a companion who could shelter them from the elements and use tools to take down larger game, which they then got a piece of. They learned to communicate with one another as well, primarily with sounds and gestures, and today, dogs are better at interpreting human gestures than any other animal, including the great apes. Together, they became a super predator with unparalleled senses and tools at their disposal. And nothing could stand in their way. And so it came to be that the humans and their wolf-dog hybrids began to travel northward. Were the Neanderthals still held territory? Predmosti, which I'm almost certainly mispronouncing, is an archaeological site in the modern-day Czech Republic and it is absolutely littered with mammoth bones, as well as old tents made from the skins. Now, Neanderthals never mastered long-distance weapons, meaning their game was primarily restricted to animals they could flush, trap, or wrestle with close-range artifacts. This means that the camps were decidedly human, an inference made more clear by the presence of hybrid wolf-dog bones found at the site, alongside those of long-dead humans. The dating of this site makes something abundantly clear. The humans, with the help of their wolf-dog hybrids, were able to outcompete 
the resident Neanderthals, and that this, in conjunction with rising climate change and the ability of humans to interbreed with the Neanderthals, is what eventually led to that hominid's extinction. Keep that in mind next time you say you aren't a dog person. Although to be fair, it's pretty clear from the fossil record that they weren't cat people either. But how incredible that the Neanderthals' demise can be traced back to around the time period that humans domesticated wolves. I mean, what a shame for these once great hominids. They were effectively usurped by a bunch of meddling homo sapiens and their dogs. Pat Shipman, retired adjunct professor of anthropology at Pennsylvania State University, makes the case for this in her new book, The Invaders. And so, as humans expanded to every quarter of the globe, their dogs came with them, adapting and evolving to each new environment in tandem. These include adaptions to high altitude, low oxygen hypoxic conditions, and genes that play a role in digestion, metabolism, neurological processes, and some even related to cancer. This partnership was so influential, so important, so extreme, that the results of it have come to be written in our very DNA. For example, prior to this partnership, neither apes nor canids relied heavily on starches in their diet. But then along came agriculture. In 2007, a study found that dog domestication was accompanied by selection at three genes with key roles in starch digestion, AMY2B, MGAM, and SGLT1, and that it was a striking case of parallel evolution. When coping with an increasingly starch-rich diet, dogs and humans experience similar adaptive responses. Essentially, when humans started growing starchy foods, the refuse piles began to take on a starchy portion, and so dogs, too, adapted digestively to the new situation. This co-evolution sneaks its way into the neurology of dogs and humans as well. Recent studies show that dogs can discriminate the emotional expressions of human faces, and that most humans can tell simply from a bark whether a dog is alone, being approached by a stranger, playing, or being aggressive, and they can similarly tell simply from a growl how large the dog is. It goes even further though, because in 2015 a study found that when dogs and owners interact, extended eye contact, or a mutual gaze, increases oxytocin levels in both dog and owner. As oxytocin is known for its role in maternal bonding, it is considered likely that this effect has supported the co-evolution of human-dog bonding as well. One observer has stated, quote, the dog could have arisen only from animals predisposed to human society by lack of fear, attentiveness, curiosity, necessity, and recognition of advantage gained through collaboration. The humans and wolves involved in the conversation were sentient, observant beings, constantly making decisions of how they lived and what they did based off of the perceived ability to obtain, at a given time and place, what they needed to survive and thrive. They were social animals, willing, even eager, to join forces with another animal to merge their sense of group with the other sense to create an expanded supergroup that was beneficial to both in multiple ways. They were individual animals and people involved, from our perspective, in a biological and cultural process that involved linking not only their lives, but the evolutionary fate of their heirs in ways, we must assume, they could have never imagined. Powerful emotions were at play that many observers today refer to as love. Boundless, unquestioning love." Unquote. So we have seen a profound acquisition by dogs of human traits. And humans have picked up a few wolf traits as well through the years. In 2002, a study proposed that immediate human ancestors and wolves may have domesticated each other through strategic alliance that would have changed both respectively into humans and dogs. The effects on human psychology, hunting practices, territoriality, and social behaviors would have been profound. Early humans moved from scavenging groups and small game hunting to big game hunting by living in larger, more socially complex groups, learning to hunt in packs, and developing powers of cooperation and negotiation in complex situations. As these are characteristics of wolves, dogs, and humans, it could potentially be argued that these behaviors were enhanced once wolves and humans began to cohabit. Communal hunting led to communal defense. 
wolves actively patrol and defend their scent-marked territory, and perhaps humans had their sense of territoriality enhanced by living with wolves. Our partnership is an incredible feat, something never before seen or since in nature. Two intelligent, social predators teaming up, learning to live together, hunt together, and forming social bonds so powerful they chemically mimic the bonds that form between mother and offspring. And we're both still here, and still in charge. Every time you snuggle your dog, or your loving pup lays their head on your knee, the two of you are echoing a bond forged long ago in the harsh world of yesterday. One so powerful, it is written in your very genes. Humans and dogs enhance one another. And that's what makes our partnership the best deal in the history of deals. <laughs> Maybe ever.